Hi, Dr. Kat Fries again from Central New Mexico Community College. In video B here on the brain, we're going to start discussing the cerebral cortex. We will not be able to finish it in this video. There's a lot to say about the cerebral cortex of human brains. It's probably the most well-developed and evolved part of our human brains. So just as a quick refresher, I grabbed this slide again that we finished with last time. A quick refresher in the sense that we remember, hopefully, that our brain is made up of four major parts. The biggest part being the cerebrum, which is all in the darker and the lighter blue here. Then we have the cerebellum and the brownish cauliflower structure here. The diencephalon sits very deep in the core of the brain. And then the remainder, the brain stem, is going to connect with the spinal cord. So if we were to continue this, we would get into this, or we would continue into the spinal cord, I should say. So the cerebrum is the biggest part of the brain, and we'll see that not just the cerebrum, but all of these four major parts will be made up of three major sub-parts. So let's get started with the cerebrum. So the three major subparts of the cerebrum are the cerebral cortex, the white matter, and then a bunch of nuclei. Now I've listed these different subparts of the cerebrum from most superficial to deepest. Now let's take a look at the figure below and allow me to point out these different regions. First of all, let's make clear we all understand how we're looking at the brain here. So here we have a full brain and we're going to slice it like this. So remember that is a frontal section or a coronal section. Coronal as in almost forming a crown and then slicing the brain that way. So this very outer layer that you see here, which is made up of gray matter, and which is very convoluted. Notice that sometimes the invaginations go very deep. This outer layer we refer to as the cerebral cortex. And again, it's made up of gray matter. Now, if we were to place a, a needle into the brain, we would first penetrate that cerebral cortex and then we'd get to a bunch of myelinated fibers. And so we refer to all of this as the white matter. Finally, deep within the cerebrum, and we don't have all of them showing here, we have what we call nuclei. And there are two major sets of nuclei. One are called the subcortical nuclei. We see some of them here in the red. Subcortical literally means sub, you know by now that means deep or deeper to, deeper to. Cortical is the adjective for cortex. So deeper to the cerebral cortex. So embedded in that white matter and deeper to the cerebral cortex, we have these collections of cell bodies. And these collections of cell bodies belong to what we call the basal nuclei. So um, this is a basal nucleus, this is a basal nucleus, this is a basal nucleus. And they all have unique names, as we will learn in a little while. This is a subcortical nucleus. Be sure that you do not go too far into the brain and identify these structures incorrectly because these are ventricles. This is where we're going to find, actually let's not put these there because that's, we have the label right here for a ventricle. What we find inside of these ventricles is cerebrospinal fluid. Remember the location of the ependymal cells that you have studied? Well, these ependymal cells line these ventricles. So this is a ventricle, and here is another ventricle that is, that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. 
and lined with ependymal cells. Okay, so now that you have somewhat of an idea of the arrangement of the subparts of the cerebrum, we're going to spend quite a bit of time discussing the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex, it makes up a huge amount of our brain because it's so convoluted and it carries out some of the most complex functions. It literally sets us humans apart from all other animals on this planet. The cerebral cortex is a, a thin gray layer of gray matter, about two to four millimeters thick. Remember that one inch is about 2.54 centimeters and that is there's 10 millimeters in a centimeter, so about 25.4 millimeters. So if we divide that by 10, that would give us about two and a half millimeters. So that's the thickness approximately of the gray matter that that's, forms the outer layer of our brain, better called the cerebral cortex. Now, as I said, it's extremely convoluted. And because of that, it has a huge surface area and therefore also makes up a substantial amount of brain mass. Take a look at that, 40% of our brain mass. A good thing for you to remember about the cerebral cortex is that that is the site where we become consciously aware of our environments, whether it's our internal environment or our external environment. It allows us to sense the environment, to become aware of it. In addition to that, it's also the part of our brain where we voluntarily can initiate our muscles to contract um, our language skills are located in the cerebral cortex, lots of memory, our reasoning, our planning, our judging, our interpreting and understanding languages, all these rather complex functions that um, many other animals really cannot do. Um, and I'm talking particularly about, you know, planning and judging and, and interpreting and communicating with language. Um, uh, are processed at the level of the cerebral cortex. Finally, we should mention that if we look at, let's say, the left cerebral cortex, and if we were to trace the neurons that control skeletal muscles and that start from the cerebral cortex, those, those somatic motor neurons or those neural, that neural pathway, I should say, will ultimately end up in the right side of the body. So in other words, if a person has damage to the left cerebral cortex, it is typically, typically going to express in that person's right side of the body. And so we say that each hemisphere, each cerebral cortex hemisphere, connects contralaterally to the body, meaning if we translate this contra meaning opposite, and lateral side. Now, not all neural pathways are contralateral. We will talk later on also about something called ipsilateral pathways. So that means that they stay on the same side of the body as how they originated or how they're going into our brain. Now, before we talk about the rather complex functions of the cerebral cortex, let's first get more acquainted with its anatomy. For one, the cerebral cortex is very wrinkly. Remember that big brain that kept developing has to fit into a relatively small skull. And so the way our brains evolved was to become very wrinkly. And this created these wrinkles that we're going to give better names. So we have the little invaginations that we refer to as sulci, singular sulcus, plural sulci. While the bumps in between two consecutive sulci, this is a bump here, we'll call the gyri or gyri for plural, gyrus singular. Sometimes we, st we see not just shallow grooves like your sulci, and sometimes we see very, very deep grooves, and we call those fissures. So for instance, the two obvious hemispheres, cerebral hemispheres, are separated by a longitudinal fissure. There's another fissure called the transverse fissure. We'll see that on one of our next slides, which separates the, the two halves of the cerebellum from these two cerebral hemispheres. Now, some of these sulci are very prominent. 
and I describe them better in, in one of the next slides, but for instance, you can see a prominent sulcus right here. We call that the central sulcus, and we see another prominent one, he, well, prominent one here. We call that the lateral sulcus, and then finally we have one here. We refer to it as the parieto occipital sulcus. And you'll see why <clears throat> that last sulcus gets that name. <clears throat> Excuse me, because these major sulci, which are landmarks for neurosurgeons, for instance, and they're very obvious on a cadaver brain, by the way, um, these, these sulci then create different lobes in the cerebral cortex. And notice that the names of the lobes very much correspond to the skull bones. So we have here the frontal lobe, we have here the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. These, should, these names should sound very familiar. And of course, these lobes occur on the other side of the brain as well. But we have a fifth lobe on both sides, and we can't see that unless we pry apart the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. So if we pry apart those two lobes, we will see the insular lobe. And we'll show that on the next slide before we go there. Remember I said there's a second fissure for you to be aware of? That transverse fissure we see right here. And it separates our cerebellum. This is our cerebellum right here. It separates the cerebellum from the rest of the brain or from the cerebrum in particular. So this right here is our transverse fissure. So here then we see the insular lobe or just the insular lobe. So we've literally um, removed a good chunk of that temporal lobe um, and left the parietal lobe and left the occipital lobe and left um, some of the frontal lobe. And so now we see deep here in what is left of the cerebrum, our insular lobe. And this picture really nicely, once again, shows how much the brain flexed upon itself during embryological development. So realize that the cerebral cortex is not just deeply invaginating here, but it's also going to be part, the outer layer of that um, insular lobe. So what is the total number of lobes in our brain? Well, we have five pairs, or a total of 10. So now that you know the locations or the names of the lobes, and you know the locations of major sulci, we, we can give the, the sulci uh, better descriptions. So the central sulcus, it is going to separate your frontal from your parietal lobe. Your lateral sulcus separates these two lobes from the temporal lobe, and then the parietal occipital sulcus describes exactly which lobes it separates.